Welcome to the Calgary Sessions. This is episode number 62. I'm your host, Jeff Humphreys. Today's guest uh, was kind of, I got connected with her through Russell Broom, and right away I was like, holy shit, this is a person. So <laughs> I was like, I, I, I knew I wanted to get you on the show, and it just happened like really, the timing was perfect. So um, please go ahead, name and who you are. My name is Lisa Jacobs. I am a professional musician. Bass guitar is my main thing, and I am also a music therapist. I'm music on that way. Mm -hmm. See, the internet didn't tell me. And again, I don't do any research. I just like look at an Instagram account. I'm like, oh, she's a musician. Yeah. But there's this on the backside of it, I too. I am also a music therapist, yes. Cool. This is good. This is going to even get better. Oh, my God. I love that you don't know anything about me, barely. It's Nothing. Perfect. And I got zero. I know that you're a talented <laughs> musician, and that is it. This is great. <laughs> so um, you've seen a couple of clips but you've never, um, of what the show is. Mm-hmm. So what I what I like the guests to do is go back into time, you know, go back to a, you know how you how you're brought up, where you're brought up, what influenced you kind of along the way, and then we'll kind of weave our path to where you are today. So um, this can go a bunch of different ways. Some people go back to early childhood, mm -hmm. to when things start clicking. Yeah. Some people go back to like junior high because the first ten years was just a blur. Or they don't nothing really happened. So yeah, go back to wherever you want to go back, and then I'll just kind of pull you along through this whole thing. Okay. Well, I think since we're talking about me as a musician, we got to basically go all the way back. Mm -hmm. So I'm born and raised in Calgary. Um, my parents are immigrants from India. I think my dad came over here probably 50 years ago and then yep. brought my mom over. Yep. And uh, my dad was a musician, is a musician. He still plays. And so really early on, music has just been a part of our household and what we did. And my older brother plays piano. And so piano was actually my first instrument. I started studying Royal Conservatory because my dad is... Um, he learned by ear, so he doesn't know how to read music, so he's always really fascinated by it and wanted his kids to be able to have, like every parent, have more than he ever was offered. And so yep. he put us in piano lessons so we could learn how to read. How and old were you when that started? Three. No way. Yeah, so I think I did my first grade one Royal Conservatory piano exam when I was like four and a half. Which is five. Like, I, I it's don't, pretty young. Yeah, I know nothing, but that seems, <laughs> that seems like a very young age. Yeah, it was. Actually, no, maybe I was five. I was in grade one and I did in, in school and did my Royal Conservatory grade one. But then this kind of like wild thing happened where um, we're in piano lessons, me, my older brother, me and my little sister, and the recession kind of hits in Calgary, and my parents can no longer afford to put all of us through piano lessons. This is early 80s? Yeah. And uh, and so we all get pulled out of piano lessons, and it turns out to be the greatest gift ever because I'm stoked about music. I've got the foundation. We've got a piano bench full of of um, music books yep. and my dad's bringing stuff home from the library for his so he can learn songs for his gigs and stuff and so I just start devouring my older brother's old books and I start to learn not just how to continue to read but I start to learn how to play by ear and I start to learn how to play chords and how to jam and do whatever else and I just start training all these other sides of my musicality mm -hmm. that the Royal Conservatory does not value or teach. Because it's it's very, um, not narrow, but it's very like methodical of what their program is. No, narrow is a perfect way to describe it. it I have yeah. loads of opinions on it. But one of them is that they really, um, they end up producing, and I think by the way that they teach, they end up producing a lot of musicians that can only play when they read stuff. Right. They can only play by reading, which is this incredible, magical gift to look mm -hmm. at a blank piece of paper that's covered in dots mm -hmm. and then to be able to create music out of it yep. by just looking at yep. it. Ugh, magic. But equally as magical and as important is to be able to listen to something and then to reproduce it on yep. an instrument and to train your ears to be able to do that. And also to find ways to hear the music inside of your own self and express that. So... Did you, um, sorry, no, go you, ahead. You're, you're fascinating. So this is going to be, I'm just going to interject all over, but when you're that young, did you, was that an instant pass passion? Like, did you know that it was going to be a thing and you wanted to like, when you were devouring all this music, did you know that it, you were different than the kids you were hanging out with? Oh, you know what's so funny? So my best friend, we met when we were three in ballet class or four, I guess. And, um, She's not really like musical at all. She's super sporty. And so um, she's actually extraordinarily sporty. So like MVP of every game in every sport. And I'm like, my main gifting is music. Like I just showed up 
being able to play, connect, hear things mm -hmm. that were already beyond, like, I just showed up on this planet already connected to that yep. space. So yeah, um, but I think that I wasn't necessarily comparing myself to a bunch of other people. Like mm -hmm. I just kind of like, you do things that you're interested in. Yep. And fortunately, I was in the kind of family where there was just stuff at my disposal. There was mm -hmm. just a piano there. There's books there. Mm -hmm. um, there's a wall of guitars hanging in our basement, which is how I ended up playing bass. Mm -hmm. So my dad had interest, my dad's a guitarist and singer and you know, he'd shown us a little bit on the guitar and then one day I'm just in the basement, I'm 10 and I've, I tell the story all the time, but cause everyone's like, why do you play bass? You're like five foot three, you're brown, you're a girl, a woman. Um, but when I started playing, like I was just a child and people were always like, what, how did this even happen? Like, what are you doing in a blues club mm -hmm. when you're 17? Um, and so we had this like basement wall, guitars, one of them was bigger than the other. And I was like, what's that, dad? And my dad's like, it's a bass. And he put it on me. And it's the red and black Fender Precision that I still play, that if you look on any of my social media or any of the artists that I play with, it's literally that bass. Same one? Same one. No way. Mm -hmm. It was basically in pristine condition when I got it. And then life has like worked itself out on it. But the first time, like, and I've tried to keep it perfect, which most musicians don't care about. They want vintage looking stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I got it so young. It was like really important to me. And so I watched this thing called weather cracks show up on it, but it's like literally where there's like a crack, cracks in your base. Yep. And I cried the first time because I thought I broke it. <clears throat> and people nowadays take their brand new guitars, put it outside in minus 30 weather so mm -hmm. that they can get cracks on their guitar. But this is stuff I didn't know. You burned it. <laughs> what did your, um, when your dad, when your parents came to Canada? Yeah. He was a mu musician back home? Yeah, so then, my, my dad started playing like and gigging when he was a teenager. What kind of music? 15, and it was like rock and roll and R&B. And so he like loved the Beatles and no the blues. Way. And so um, he was kind of like a rock and roll musician in India. Like literally him and his buddies were building their own electric guitars because you couldn't buy an electric guitar. Like literally carving out wood painting it in a car shop, paint shop, and like winding their own pickups, which is what makes an electric guitar make sound. Building their own amplifiers from scratch, building their own pedals. It is wild. I don't even know what they're doing. Um, he was just, <clears throat> it's, I can't imagine back then, whatever year it was, like rock and roll back then where he grew up, I'm sure it was like this, not a lot of people were into it. Yeah. Or, well, get, or didn't have exposure to it or like, well, they're like young kids, so yeah. it's like that everywhere. Like BBC is on the radio, so mm. they're listening to mm. whatever music BBC is putting out, and they're mm. teenagers. They're not mm. listening to what their parents are listening mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, just like everyone else around the world. Yeah. Um. So, but it is very, I guess, atypical of someone from India to like, like I grew up not listening to any Indian music, mm. and I grew up listening to um, R and B and blues. Awesome. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of, it's, it is really interesting. And so, um, my dad actually moved to Canada to study flying. So he was a pilot and that's what brought him over here. Mm. And then he brought my mom over and they got married and then had a bunch of kids. Here you are. <laughs> where, um, where was he gigging in Calgary? Do you, do you know much about his like history of like how it all, like when he started playing around town and what he was up to? Oh my gosh. So my dad moved here to study flying and he was like in this like host family's home and they were like, well, you're going to need to get a job and you can, there's like some ads for a dishwasher down the street. And they gave my dad the paper and told him to go get a dishwashing job. And my dad um, was like, uh, yeah, that's not for me. So my dad has a lot of pride and mm -hmm. he will not be washing any dishes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's totally fine to do. Yep. But he looked in the paper and was like, oh, there's auditions for some guitar players. So my dad's like super fresh from India, has literally dismantled his guitar, like taken the neff off the body and put it in his suitcase. And that's how we brought it to Canada. So he finds a screwdriver, puts it back together and shows up at this audition. And um, there's all these guys coming out of this like audition for this band and they've got like big Marshall stacks, so like huge amplifiers. Mm -hmm. And my dad's just like fresh from India, got his like guitar, doesn't have a guitar strap. I think he's taken like a bathrobe tie so he could like stand up and play. Goes to the audition, kills it. Cause you know, my dad was great at playing lead guitar and he gets the job and then goes on tour across Western Canada 
um, right when he gets here. And this is like, my dad doesn't know what winter is properly. No one can imagine what a winter in Canada is like when mm -hmm. you're from somewhere near the equator. Yep. So we, and he's also in his early 20s. And so all his friends, even though they're from here, are also idiots. So they're like wearing cool jean jackets and like leather jackets and changing tires that have like in the middle of Saskatchewan <laughs> one of those in stories? the middle of winter. Yeah, off of their band van. You know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's kind of like how he did it. And then um, he played music the whole time we were growing up. And yep. he also was a pilot. He was also um, a flight instructor. Yep. And he was also a car salesman because you just got to do whatever it takes to yep. make it work. Did he, was, he, um, <clears throat> was he dragging you around to different gigs or events where it was like... You know, if it was, uh, you know, if you could watch, if you, if underages, underagers could come in or like watch setups or like, were you around his um, performances? So I think I didn't see my dad play a ton, a ton, because he was playing in, in bars and lounges yeah. and maybe some unsavory places for children to play. But he also played at church on Sunday mornings. Mm. And so we would see him play there. Mm. And my actual first professional gig was at the Calgary Blues Festival when I was 12. My dad had a gig there and he went to put together a band. And the story kind of goes that the band didn't really want to rehearse and my dad doesn't want to just play like three chord blues numbers. He wanted to do some like other stuff. So they need to have a rehearsal. And they didn't want to rehearse. And my dad was like, whatevs, I've got children. <laughs> <laughs> and he had gigged with my older brother for a while, but you know, my brother became a teenager and was like, nah, I'm good. I'm not playing with dad. Yeah. And then my, so, you know, there's me and my sister. So I played bass. My sister played keys. We traded off on a couple of songs and, you know, we played, um, Olympic Plaza and we played at Eau Claire and we were on TV. They did like a whole new segment on us because... Because it's like a family? 11 and 12 years old playing blues and with so, our dad. And talented. Like, <laughs> I'm sure you guys were. Is it on film? Can, I, can you see this? Can you, or is it? Oh, yeah. There's like, there's still, um, I have like a VHS tape yeah. with the broadcast. And were you good? Like, was the family I band mean, good? We could play, yeah. 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 Like, I, could, I was playing boogie bass lines and stuff. Awesome. Now, mind you, I'm 12 and very small. So, <laughs> you just got um, this giant. <laughs> And I have this huge bass. It's a full size bass. And so I was so small that I actually had to create my own technique for how to play it. I didn't take any bass lessons, right? And so I used to use two fingers to hold the strings down. So I literally would be like, bonk, 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 you know, that kind of thing. Actually, it's funny because sometimes when I'm tired, if you were to watch my hands, you can still see me. It looks like I'm using two fingers. I am now strong enough. I don't mean to, but You've this grown. other one like drags along. My technique looks terrible. But it's one of those things that it's like it was born out of just like me not knowing like mm. I didn't know that yeah. like women weren't really playing bass guitar like yeah. that's an unusual instrument I didn't know that the bass was like way too big for me um I didn't know that I shouldn't be doing any of this and you know I just was doing it so mm -hmm. you just kind of figure out a way to make it work and you have and you're and because you is a, mu a musical family mm -hmm. it's just like whatever anything goes like as long as you're into it and loving it like just do your thing well, I, I got to give some credit to my dad. My dad definitely was of the mindset that I will teach all of my children, regardless of their gender, whatever I know how to do. Mm. Be it music, be it me being like 10 years old, waking up to my dad, like having to fix a tap and helping him fix the tap. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I think w one time for Father's Day, I did this post where my dad, I was like, my dad taught me the difference between a Fender and a Gibson, the difference between a flathead and a Phillips, you know, like screwdrivers yeah, or whatever. Yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> so, sorry, I didn't mean to explain that to you. That was more for like your public. Oh yeah, totally. No, I'm, I'm glad you <laughs> did. Because not cause everyone knows what a flathead I, and a Phillips I are. I agree, it's so true. <laughs> yeah, and so he didn't really put those kinds kinds of um, gender things on us mm. in that sort of way. So yeah. I was just playing bass. It didn't really matter. Um, so your first gigs at 12-ish, like first public thing, is that? Yeah, even younger than that. But that was probably like the big thing. The, the, like, the yeah. thing? I played at like a senior's home before that. <laughs> <laughs> just to like um, I'll tell the story. <laughs> I don't know. I can barely remember it. But sometimes we would go to senior's homes with my dad and like sing. or you Yeah, know. just to like um, brighten yeah. your day and just kind of like give them a break in their day and something new and interesting. Yeah, I think one of my my dad the one of my dad's band members, his mom was like in a senior's mm. home. So we went to like mm. entertain them and yep. you just bring your children cuz they're adorable and children performing are adorable. So Check. why not, right? <laughs> um 
Did and you then know? I also played at church. Oh. So yeah. Did you, um, when you're in front of people, were you comfortable? Did you know right away that you could actually stand up and, and do something you were super passionate about and be comfortable up there? Or is it, was it, did you have to talk yourself through it? Oh, you know what's really interesting about that? So I've been thinking a bit about this because, um, so my sister also can play music, but yep. she did not um, can pursue that. Yep. She's done a lot of other artistic things. But we've been doing these kind of like dumb recorder videos where she plays recorder and I play any other instrument. Like and cur- she's, currently you're doing these things? We started it over the pandemic awesome. um, as a way to like, cause we made this video for my mom's 75th birthday and we just wanted to do something like stupid for her. Yeah. So we played happy birthday and like my sister, I'm playing ukulele. We got kind of dressed up and then my sister plays the recorder mm-hmm. and my sister's cool. She's got a big Afro. She's like a super cool human. Mm-hmm. She's a hairstylist. She looks awesome. And then she's got this hilarious recorder and she's terrible at it. It's squawking. She can barely remember how to play, but she, like is looking deadpan at the camera, doesn't blink, doesn't move, doesn't do anything, and just forges ahead. And I end up laughing. Like I spend the entire song trying not to laugh because I am a supportive older sister, you know? And I'm a music therapist. Like I am here to support people through whatever version of music they're playing. Mm -hmm. But you can't, I can't help it because you just end up laughing because it is terrible and so funny and so... (laughs) What I started noticing, people ended up loving it. We ended up posting it. People love it. It's very funny. Mm-hmm. And what I started to notice, it's like my sister's not acting. Like she can't blink because she, and she can't move her body because she's so nervous mm-hmm. and so focused that she can't do anything. She's got like stage fright, basically. She mm-hmm. gets a little bit of stage fright. And yep. I am literally the exact opposite. And I think that one of the reasons why our paths diverge is from very even early on, um, even though we could both play music. Yep. I loved um being in front of people Mm. and i don't have to be the star of the room but like i don't mind being in front of people that like that is exciting to me Mm. and i do of course still get nervous because i'm doing things that put me out of my comfort zone but i like love the i love being on stage and i love the interaction with an audience enough for me to not care about feeling nervous i love playing music in that kind of way where people get to see me Mm -hmm. enough that doesn't really matter that I'm nervous. And I noticed one thing during the pandemic, which this is going to be kind of embarrassing to admit, but during the pandemic where I'm like playing music and I have like this online gig, I'm doing videos, you know, with yep. my friends or whatever, we're putting it online, but there's like no audience, like you, no one's clapping for you. Yeah. And so like this thing on. Yeah, totally. Right. And then we were doing this thing, I think at the Ironwood or somewhere shooting something. And there was like a camera person there and like two other people. And they applauded for us at the end of a song. And I was like, oh my gosh. I like, my heart was so starved (laughs) for the affirmation of applause. Which I don't want to say that to be a truth, but it is like like, part of me. Yeah. yeah. Because part of the, when you're a musician, when you're on stage, like it's the energy that the crowd can give you. Mm-hmm. You know, there's energy with the band, I'm sure, and then there's the, the interaction with the crowd, and that probably either like keeps you going or keeps you engaged or just like it probably drives a lot. Yeah, and like I like it. Yeah, you know, like I I I like that. So it's like, like tingly. Like do you get like when you're having like when you're in a when you're in a room, mm-hmm. you're playing with an amazing band, and you know that it's like going really well, and the crowd's like into it. They're giving you like a positive response. Like do you still get goosebumps? Like do you? Oh. Like the tingles, like do you still like get those and you're just like, oh my, it's happening? Oh, absolutely. I am moved when I play music. Yeah. I always? Am... Oh, no. Not but there's always. moments. There's moments. But who I am as a musician, I am constantly seeking to be connected to the song, be connected to the music, be yep. connected to the audience. So I will find beauty in whatever I'm doing, whatever genre I'm playing, yep. whatever style of gig I'm playing, whether people are paying attention or people are not. Mm-hmm. I, I really work hard to seek that out. And I think that's sort of created part of the longevity I've had in my career. Yep. Um, because not every gig is a perfect gig. Mm. And... Uh, that, that seems like impossible. Even if all of your gigs are amazing gigs, yep. you get tired of that. Yep. Um, you need, like, oh, I would. I need the variation. And so, 
Yeah, I think that I always seek to find beauty in whatever I'm doing, and oftentimes that's connecting with other people. If I can't connect with the musicians I'm playing with, which mm. sometimes happens, yep. I find a way to connect to the music inside of myself mm. or to check out the effect it's having having on other people. So yep. I'm seeking out that for sure. Yep. Um, but there, I get to play music with some extraordinary human beings. And so I feel moved by sometimes what they're doing musically, or the message that they have, mm -hmm. or even looking out and seeing the way a person is, what, the way the music's having an effect on a person. Mm -hmm. Ugh. That's gotta just So like, great. Like it's just, <laughs> I just, I can just, it's almost like ch chills, you know? Like I'm sure when you see somebody reacting to you, it's special. Totally, and as a music therapist, even mm -hmm. more so because mm -hmm. I'm, looking, evaluating, changing, adapting what I'm doing all the time based on the goals that I have with a particular um, client and what we're trying to accomplish. But, you know, I get to see some really special moments happen with different kinds of people and mm -hmm. have it happen via mm -hmm. the vehicle of music, right? When you're gigging and or if you're doing wherever, like if you're doing a studio thing or if you're doing like a live performance, if if you don't if that situation's not coming up, you know, if you're not, if it's people aren't engaged or if they're just, you know, they're just a little touristy, you know, they're just kind of there, and you're not getting that response, what do you do? Oh, okay, so this is so great. Um, I, I have this philosophy that, well, uh, maybe I'm just gonna speak for myself, but I think a lot of people could relate to this, that having a variety of different kinds of things can um, bring a lot of beauty in life to ourselves. So. Um, I get the opportunity to play a lot of shows that are like where everyone's listening, it's in a theater, mm -hmm. but um, and they're like these magical things to have everyone stare at you and yep. everyone be really connected to what's going on and yep. every note you play really, really matter. Mm -hmm. It's so amazing to be able to do that and also it's so stressful. Mm -hmm. Like you're not taking major risks in those moments, you're trying to play basically with the greatest amount of excellence and perfection that you possibly can, right? Yep. Um, even though perfection is a, a goal not to be chased necessarily, but like with as much excellence. And also because like you can hear everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. It's so stressful and amazing and stressful, right? Mm -hmm. And so some of my favorite gigs have been when no one cares that you're playing or that you're up there because it allows for this kind of freedom of mm. expression. Yep. And in those moments, and in some... Um, I actually just had this happen like two weeks ago. So I've come off of like playing a bunch of TV things, a bunch of theater shows, a bunch of stuff where like a bunch of things with people, with musicians I'm not super familiar with and music I'm not super familiar with. So stuff where I have to just be like so focused but make it look like I'm having a great time and I'm mm -hmm. super rock and roll, but my brain is really like, what is the chord in the bridge, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. And uh, and so I've done, been doing a lot of that stuff and then I got to play um, a pub show at the Blues Can and it's an original show and everyone's paid money to come see and, but it, there's like, I'm playing with people, with an artist that I've worked with lots before. I've co-written a bunch of the songs. I played on a record. So like, I know this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like even if my mind wanders off to anywhere, yep. my hands know what to do. Mm -hmm. I'm playing in a three piece. So just um, the vocalist who also plays guitar, bass and drums. So there is a lot of room as a bass player to just like fill up space because yep. there's no one playing any solos. There's no like lead lines happening. So I can just like play. And uh, you know, a lot of the bar is paying attention because they've come to see her, but also it's a bar. Like there's like servers handing out drinks yeah, yeah. and people putting in <coughs> orders and people chatting a little bit, mm -hmm. like it's relaxed. So I just played, I took lots of risks. I played some awesome stuff, but because I was taking risks, some of it was not that great. Some of it's repeatable, some of it is never do that again. <laughs> but that kind of environment allows for that and gives you the space to yeah. like stretch out. And I think in life we need that kind of spaces. So we need spaces where no one's paying attention mm. or less people are paying attention or the, the risk, there's room for risks, you yeah. know? Yeah. And I think anyone doing anything needs the opportunity for that. Otherwise we get stifled, yeah, yeah. right? It's just mundane. Yeah. Did you, um, you've been playing for a long time. Mm -hmm. Have you, have you always known these things? You know, like when you're, when you're early in your career, there's good, good gigs, bad ones. Did you always know how to kind of handle them and, and what was happening? And if they weren't going good, how to just like be more internal with it? 
did you always know these things or this, is this like is this a lifetime of music that you've got to these <laughs> these <laughs> this knowledge <laughs> this is a lifetime of music yeah i mean that's the great thing about waking up and living for the next day is that we just get more experience yeah. and also have the opportunity for hindsight right like i can like look back and assess what was working, what was, wasn't working, who I am in these moments, yep. or how I want to create the way that I want to feel. Mm. So like, do I want to be miserable on a gig even though I hate the gig? Which happens, sometimes mm. you hate your job. Yep. And uh, like, no, like I really don't. Like I chose this whirlwind life of being a musician, not to be miserable, mm. but like not every moment of being, of being a musician, not every moment of choosing something that's your great passion is enjoyable. Yep. Like that's what happens when you turn a passion into work, like it's still work. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I can't always control the stuff around me, but I can control who I am in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. And so I try and like take stock of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so those are definitely things just like from living life. Yeah. Um, can you walk it back to after this first gig, you're 12, you're doing this, and just like, walk me through the decision to become a musician, you know, like what that actually, what that looks like, you know, are you, do you have that figured out in high school? Do you have that figured out coming out of high school? Like, what does it actually look like to become a professional musician? And was it, you know, did you always know that was gonna be your play? So I think one of the things that's, I guess, unique about my situation is that I don't think I actually chose to be a professional musician. Mm. I just always was playing. And then I got to be involved in opportunities where I got paid to play. Yep. And I love playing. And I don't just love playing alone in my bedroom, although I do really love that too. I love playing with other people mm. and creating and collaborating and I love performing. And so um, I don't think I chose to be a professional musician where the way, in the same way that people decide that. I think it's just who I am and what I've been doing. Mm. And just saying yes to those kinds of opportunities. Yep. I did make an attempt to not play professionally. Like, do you go to high school and then you decide to go to like, do you go to music school or something? Or like, yeah, okay. So my, so I'm playing like I'm playing bass in all the school bands. Yep. I'm playing at my church. I'm playing. Yep. I'm like the music director of the youth group, and I'm gigging also on the side. So, um, like out, I, out in public doing whatever, like uh, mm -hmm. bars or like wherever. Yeah. Yeah, and so Where, where's rattle off some of the names like where there's like a, how, you've Oh, been, yeah, you've been, you've been here a long time. Like I'm, born, stuff, I'm so. born and raised here So I'd love to just like so I can picture these things. Okay, so I used to play like at the shamrock. No way Oh, yeah, awesome sometimes every single Sunday we hmm. would host a thing um, The blues can and then back in the day like Wildwood and chaos mm -hmm. and um, Oh my gosh, I can't even so you were you were school ones. you were playing a bunch Everywhere, like in high school, just out of high school. Yeah, just out of high school. And then like, um, I stopped playing music with my dad, but then, cause you know, when you're a teenager, doing stuff with your parents isn't cool at all. But then, um, <laughs> and he constantly gave me invites to participate. Yep. And then finally I was like, yeah, I'll do that. And so I ended up paying for my university, uh, mostly through gigging. And what'd you take there? Um, so I did my degree in music therapy, but it took me a while to figure out I wanted to be a music therapist also because I'm not sure I really knew that existed as a profession. Yep. Um, but my parents were adamant about me only taking one year off of school and then going into school because out of like I'm academic inclined. So they're like, one of you guys has to get a post-secondary degree. And so, um, I like took a bunch of stuff that I was interested in, in university, like psychology yep. and, and cultural anthropology and sociology. So all the stuff that I'm into. Mm -hmm. And I didn't actually, I was like, I had thought about maybe going to music school and I had like, I was gonna go down to LA actually. And then mm. I just had this weird gut feeling that that wasn't what I was supposed to do. Which is a weird thing for a 17 year old yep. who plays music all the time to yep. think, but I just had this feeling, so I didn't do it. And then I found out about music therapy and part of the route to being coming a music therapist is doing like post-secondary music school. So I ended up doing um, a jazz program here in Calgary at Mount Royal University when they still had one and I did it on electric bass performance. Mm -hmm. And so I did that and then I moved to Vancouver to be a part of a music therapy program there, which is where I finished my undergrad. Hmm. And so in the music therapy um, program, you end up doing like guitar and piano and singing because those are the things that you use more than perhaps what your main instrument is. Yeah. And definitely in my case, because my main instrument's bass, I hmm. use that very in infrequently. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so like, it, go back, sorry I interrupted you, but you were talking about um, 
you didn't necessarily choose this path. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just kind of on a path, it sounded like, and it just became this thing. Like, so when you're going to school, you graduate with your degree. Did you think you were going to be like a full-time therapist and the music was just going to be there on the side? Or what were you, what were you thinking when that was happening? Okay, so even while I was going to school, um, I almost actually got kicked out of my music therapy program in the last year because I kept um, having to leave to go play gigs in other provinces. (laughs) And so I would miss school. So you were like touring around? Kind of, or like just getting flown out or whatever. And so... um, so my, my professors weren't too stoked about that, but I was like, I'll just make it all work because that's how life is, right? And then um, I ended up landing an internship um, really early on, and it was back in Calgary. And so I finished in Vancouver, and I decided not to stay out there, and I came back to do an internship here. And I was gigging like three or four nights a week while doing a full-time internship. Crazy. It was a lot. I didn't sleep very much. Yeah. And writing like this huge paper mm-hmm. and... Um, and I was kind of like, wow, I don't know how sustainable this is. And also my focus is always divided. And so I got this job as a full-time music therapist. I'm an employee at this company, JB Music Therapy, which I still contract to today. In town, today. Yeah. yeah, in okay. town. Yeah. But I was an employee for a brief time. And I was like, I'm going to just focus on one thing and just be a music therapist. And I was for like two months. And then I was like, holy, I need to make music with my peers. I need to perform and be on stage. I gotta play bass guitar. Like my heart hungered, Mm. hungers for music in that way. And so I have spent my life doing both simultaneously. Mm. And it ebbs and flows as to how much I'm doing in one space or the other. But it's been kind of remarkable. And honestly, like I couldn't have really dreamed this up had I tried. It's just been how it's unfolded for me. But like, I work for this company as a contractor and you know, as a music therapist and Jennifer who owns it, she's also like a dear friend, but she believes in me as a human Mm -hmm. and as a musician and whatever endeavors I'm gonna go out to. So like, when it's time for me to like wander, which happens, I get a bit stir crazy being in one place for too long, I just go away on tour for six months and then people can take over my clients and then I kind of come home And it's like when I'm needing like a little bit more stability or needing to be grounded or needed to be connected to humans in a different way than you get maybe on tour, music therapy offerings show up in abundance. Mm -hmm. And so then I'm able to like do that and stay home for a little bit. So my life has really been an ebb and flow of those two things. Is it um, uncomfortable to know that's how it operates? Like just to to know that there is a way that this I'm sure there's not a lot of examples of people doing this. You know, there's like to be a professional musician is a very um, small number of people that actually pull that off. Mm-hmm. And then so you don't there's no real blueprint to follow. So to understand that like it just kind of ebbs and flows and you kind of come in and out. Like, is that you just know that's the way it is and you're super comfortable with that? Or did you <laughs> did you have to did it take you a while to get to that comfort level where you could kind of understand how you operate? Um, well, I think anytime you choose to work for yourself or be freelance in anything or choose the wild, wild west that is being an artist, um, there is this element of choosing freedom over stability. Mm-hmm. And freedom is amazing. And I get to make my own schedule and I get to do a lot of different things with mm-hmm. a lot of different people in a lot of different places. And it's so exciting and I'm so fortunate for that. But there are absolute periods in my life where I just wish that I could go to work at 8.30 a.m. Just like. And yeah, and like, and just like type into a spreadsheet mm-hmm. and not have it require mm-hmm. me be anybody special mm-hmm. or do anything um, or require any of my creativity or any of my talents just where I can just go do a thing and then leave it at home and come home and not think about it or worry about it or have to work toward it at all. Yep. And there are times when I create just the, crave like the structure of that, mm-hmm. you know, and so. Why is that? And the, the only reason I'm asking you because I, I told you off camera, like I played, I DJed for a while in town. Mm. So there's that like all your peers are doing these things. They're getting real job, real jobs. You're, I'm working in clubs three nights a week, spinning records. Yeah. And the grass isn't always greener, but what is it? What is it that like your head goes to that structure piece as a super creative person? Why does your head go to structure? I think it's absolutely dependent on who I am just in the rest of my life. Mm. So when I have, you know, when life has its hardships and I am 
you know, going through difficulties and I'm feeling like depleted as a human, yep. you know, when, when I'm going, I don't know, through depression or traumas yep. or there's a lot of drama or whatever, you yep. know, life is bringing things at you all the time. Mm-hmm. It's in those moments where I don't feel like I have much to offer yeah. the world around me. And I chose two professions that require much of me. Yeah. Like you're giving a lot of energy to both. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's in those moments, I think, when I don't have a lot that I seek something that doesn't require for me to be anybody special. Mm. Or not special, that's not the word I want to use, but for me to be something. Yeah. And uh, and provide something for somebody. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Do you, um, is it short-lived when you feel like that? Oh, sometimes it's so long-lived. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing, though. I think it's human to require structure, and um, and I let me start that again. I know that this is like a. I know you're on this thought. There's something that I can mm-hmm. I can feel that you've thought about this, and there's something there. So yeah, 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 yeah. Take your time. Um, I think it's very human to love and loathe freedom. Because with freedom also comes the responsibility of the freedom. And to love and loathe structure. And we need both of those things in our world. And I work with little kids a lot. And I notice, and I I gain so much from being able to work with them because I can, they reflect so much about life to me. And so if you just ask them to do literally anything, like, and give them an abundance of music instruments and they can just do anything. A lot of times people get like a bit nervous about what to do because it's way too open and there's just way too much lack of restriction. There's way too much freedom. But as soon as you um, put in a couple of parameters, Mm -hmm. so I add a little bit of music or I give them a topic to think about or I create the kind of tempo or beat or I ask them what they want it to be, any kind of parameter right away there's a little box of structure that allows for us to push against it, to either break free from it or to be free within it. And I mean, that's a concept that's common. It's not something I made up, but I watch it happen just even in my own sort of like world and life. And, um, and so I think that, I think actually like one of the fallacies that we kind of create around people that work as artists is that we're like creative all the time and we're just like out there and we have all these ideas and Mm -hmm. it's so like Mm -hmm. great and then we have to rein it in. Oh man, we're like wandering through a whole bunch of things Mm -hmm. all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And um, do we create, crave the stability of like work hours and do I crave that stability and um, knowing how much I'm gonna get paid a month or, um, knowing who I'm going to work with and going to one specific place all the time and knowing the people and knowing the expectations. Yeah, I do crave that. And I crave being able to do whatever I want also and being able to like have the unknown be a part of it. I like that too. And so my desire for both of those things changes with who I am as a person. And I've just come to like accept and love and embrace that and hate it because sometimes it doesn't always work out perfect. <laughs> but that's life. It would be insane to think that was always feeling good all the time. It rarely is if you're pushing through stuff. Yeah. And, and, and some people think <clears throat> this isn't just a creative conversation. This is like a anything. Mm-hmm. Anybody in, that's in the, in the structured thing probably doesn't want to do that all the time either. And they're probably looking at the creative opportunities and be like, how, the, how is somebody pulling this off? So. Totally. And they can see, like, you see the freedom, but you also see the anxiety that comes Mm -hmm. along with freedom. And we see the stability, but we also see the other side of structure and stability, which can sometimes not be that fun. Mm -hmm. Can you um, talk a little bit about the, like, your musical path? So after you kind of finish university and to be gigging this long, to be playing with who you play with Mm -hmm. and be playing at that level, I just like, what does that, what does that path look like? Like... How does it how does it all start happening? Is it is it luck? Is it you being very talented? Is it straight hard work and just like sacrificing to to be in front of a bunch of people all the time? Or like what does that path actually look like? Yeah, like all of the above. Mm-hmm. I think you might have just answered it, but <laughs> So you're telling me to shut up over here. <laughs> no, I was like, that's a perfect answer, yes. Um, check. So I think that and, and, sorry, before you get going. Yeah. The reason I'm I'd love to hear this just because there's some people that listen to this that are musicians mm-hmm. at different at different points in their career. And to, to have the opportunity for me to like pick your brain on this, I think is insightful because 
you're doing something that not a lot of people can do. True. Oh, that's nice to think about. Because um, really, for uh, again, I don't know everything about you. I know that you're really good and you've been doing it for a long time, but you know, there's a lot of people that are starting or just kind of getting into things. They're like probably looking at you like, how the hell did you get there? <laughs> I think that having built a career in the music industry. Um, well, one, I've done a lot of different kinds of things. So mm. I, I don't think I was really good enough at just bass guitar performing to like just do that exclusively. So, and I know most of my friends who are professional musicians, they do a lot of stuff. So they do in-studio stuff. They, some of them are teachers. Some of them, they do clinics. They are producers. They're songwriters, so I've diversified my career in that way. And then I also have music therapy too, which is yep. another diversification of it. Um, I think that I said yes to a lot of different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And all along the way, I didn't look down or snub anything that anyone was doing or that I was doing and yep. um, chose to see the opportunity in that. So instead of instead of like looking at a gig in this, at this bar that holds 30 people you're like yeah it's like maybe below where I should be playing you're just like this is an opportunity to do something yes and and um also making wise choices about what's going to make me feel good about my world and yeah. what I'm doing because yeah. um because sometimes playing in a teeny tiny little bar with 30 people there or no people there isn't good for your soul. Yeah. And like I was saying earlier, sometimes playing in a teeny tiny bar where no one's there and I can just do whatever I want is amazing for my soul and exactly what I need. Yeah. And so it's m more of a matter of not what's out there, but figuring out what's going to work for me in any kind of given circumstance. Mm -hmm. So much of being um, a musician is about being able to work with other people and cultivating and building relationships, which yep. is something outside of music. Um, being able to deal with the anxiety that is working with human beings, because it's not always easy. You have, like, Ian, and as a, as a side person, I'm dependent on oftentimes other people yep. and where their vision is and what they're doing. Um, and then when I was doing stuff that was like my own music, um, I'm dependent on me showing up and putting in the work and doing it. And I did practice lots. I, I worked hard at my instrument, but also I didn't just work hard at my instrument by myself in my bedroom. I put myself in positions to be able to make music with people mm -hmm. uh, because music is, and the way that I play music and the instrument that I chose, the bass, like it's a community instrument, you know? Mm -hmm. It's only so fun by yourself. Like I can play piano by myself for, I could do that for hours because you can just play piano alone yep. and it's amazing. But bass isn't as different that way. And the way that I love music is in connection. So I sought out opportunities to play with people. Um, like you put in, you put in, um, it was a conscious decision to kind of like network however you did back then, whether it was before social or however you could. Yeah, so when I moved back, um, when I moved back from Vancouver back to Calgary, and you know, I had a bunch of gigs already lined up, but then I was noticing, you know, there's not, there's not some work, like I need to like get back into the community so people yep. know I'm here, yep. or people like discover me for the first time. And uh, so I would start going to jams, um, and blues jams and stuff, and I, I'm, I would get so nervous it's so embarrassing. I was telling uh, this young person that I was hanging out with that I still get nervous at jams. And it's ludicrous because I have great ears. I can listen and follow what's going on. If yep. anyone tells me, like, it's cool, I have ideas, I'm yep. creative, I love performing. And I still get freaked out. And fortunately for me, and this actually has been in all kinds of situations for me, um, is that Sometimes I can be shy. Sometimes I'm very outgoing and sometimes I am stand at the back of the wall. But people have seen my potential or people have seen me play or people recognize that I might have something to offer. And instead of hoping that I will boldly go forward, which sometimes I'm not, sometimes we're not always bold people, people will pluck me out and allow for me to quote unquote take the stage in whatever way that means. Yeah. You know, whether or not I get to share my opinion on some t something without raising my hand. Someone will just ask about my opinion. I have one, um, and so in these like in these in these jam situations, someone would write my name down. So I've been a professional musician. I've been playing blues forever, 
And someone would have to write my name down on the sheet. The woman that was running the jam, she would write my name down and then they would call me up because I was like too nervous to write my name down. It doesn't make any sense. But I think it's just one of those great examples of how we need each other mm -hmm. to, see our, to see ourselves and to see each other. Like, we don't like live in this little world where we can just like boldly forge ahead all by ourselves, mm -hmm. you know? And like once I was given the opportunity to stand on the stage, yeah, I look bold as fuck. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I look, I, I like I'm confident, yeah. but sometimes I just need someone to like yeah. give me that little push. And so I love to do the same for other people, just grab them up and yeah. give them an opportunity to shine and see themselves. How do you um how do you balance the um how do you how do you say it side how do you how do you coin yourself side person side person mm -hmm. so you have that piece and then you have your own like doing your own music mm -hmm. that balance what does that look like is it um do you just have swings is it just like a ebb and flow kind of thing where you're like I'm gonna focus on my own thing or I have ideas I need to figure out and I'm gonna put my own thing together like is it um, okay, so I would say for a lot of my life, I've been like a little bit afraid of whatever my own thing looked like. So a lot of my writing was connected to music therapy yeah. or my writing was very much for myself. Mm. I think because I spent so much of my life making music that other people got to consume or witness or see yeah. that I would just do like all of my original stuff was just solely for me. Mm -hmm. Has it been, have many people had the opportunity to hear it? So then, I mean, this has shifted over time, right? Right, right? And and also, it's like I say this thing where I'm just like, I like to just write original music for myself, that so I have my own thing. But also, it's like, are, are you just really scared to just put your stuff out there? And yes, the answer is both of those things, obviously. Yep. <laughs> um, but I would say that I've loved co-writing with people, and I had an original project for a while. It's called Jocelyn and Lisa, and um, that was with a pop artist named Jocelyn Alice. And we played together for a few years, put out an EP, did a bunch of different things. Mm -hmm. And that was a really special experience for me being um, an artist where like my picture was on the front of the album because I have very specifically chosen to be a freelance musician and a side person. And, and that was actually the only band that I ever agreed to be in. And when Jocelyn Alice asked me to be in a band with her, I was like, give me a month to think about it, whether I no or not I want to take that on. Because I love the freedom of just like wandering around with a bunch of humans. It's kind of awesome. Mm -hmm. And so um, as far as like doing my own thing and then being a side person, my tendency is to be a side person. Yep. And I love that. I love coming alongside human beings. Mm -hmm. And I think that in my music therapy practice, I have a lot of um, I'm creating everything that's happening in this 30 mm. or hour long session. It's all on me. And so I get that part of me really fulfilled there. It's an interesting mix. Yeah. Like to have, to have this like super, both are creative. Yeah. One has structure. One is like maybe a little less structured just because it comes, you know, you don't know who, when you're going to play or mm -hmm. how often or where or with who. Mm -hmm. Could you, <laughs> like, you can't plan this out. You couldn't have planned this out. <laughs> or could you, or did you? Maybe you're like super thoughtful and insightful and you could actually see this, see this path, but it just sounds like very unique. Like a choose your own adventure? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> like, Do you want to know what? I spent, and I still sometimes feel like this, but I spent a very long time wishing I was the kind of person that could have a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, who was really good at goals. Why is that? Is it because you're, like your peer group is working on those things? Or is it because, and I feel the same way. It's mm. like weird. And this is why I'm asking you to feel that pressure. Where are we, where are we getting it from? Is oh, it, society. But like some of these gurus that talk about how to do things properly, like how to build a business or how to do whatever. They're like, hey, you need these things. You need all the structure behind you. Is that where we're picking it up from? I think so. I think, you know, we have this expectation to know what we're going to do when we graduate from school. And every year New Year's comes along and everyone comes up with all these resolutions and goals for their life. And quite frankly, I've always been terrible at it. Yeah. And what I ended up having to do at a really young age, even like for New Year's, I would come up with a word for the year. And now it's become kind of a popular thing to do when I started it, basically. <laughs> <laughs> it was me. <laughs> <laughs> My desire for that was birthed out of a desire to like want to have some goals for the year, but yep. also like really struggling with what that meant for me. Yep. And so I would do things like just come up with a word that would guide me. Hmm. Um, to help me make decisions. So yep. one year was the year of fear squashing. Hmm. 
And I would just, and just having that in the back of my mind yep. helped me choose the stuff that I was going to be doing mm -hmm. professionally, personally, all of that. Yep. And so I think as far as dreaming goes, um, I'm not sure if I was just like not good at dreaming or I was a bit afraid to dream or I was afraid to utter my dreams. Mm -hmm. But you know, when I was a kid in my bed, I could see myself playing in front of thousands of people. Cool. But I also would never have told anybody that. I don't think I ever would have believed that for mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like I was like, yes, I am gonna be a rock star. Mm -hmm. I'm just, it, it, it didn't show up like that for me for whatever reason. And so I think that what ended up happening for me is that because I didn't have a master plan for my life, I have done a ton of things I never would have dreamed of. Do they all make sense though now? I, have you, do you ever give much thought where you can like look at all the kind of random things you've been experiencing over all these years and you're like, oh, I understand why I went there. I understand. And, and it's just like, it all makes sense. Absolutely. And you know, they're all very much linked, right? Like mm -hmm. nothing's just randomly showing yep. up, even though a bunch of the stuff that I've done have been pretty random, mm -hmm. but there's always connections. And so I'll give you an example. I got to play acoustic guitar for Jan Arden for, um, in Calgary, it was called the Grandstand Show. So it's this huge show at the end of Stampede for 10 days, and there's like 17,000 people there, 15,000 people, 10,000 people, whatever. It's like a huge crowd. Big. It's big, it's a huge show. Mm -hmm. And I got asked if I could play guitar. And uh, listen, I am predominantly a bass guitarist. Had I been asked to play bass for this, no problem. Um, my next best instrument is piano. <laughs> You know, so, that's going to happen. So acoustic. And then acoustic guitar. So I play acoustic guitar every single day for my music therapy practice. Mm -hmm. And I was in this band called Jocelyn and Lisa where Jocelyn didn't play an instrument. And we just did this bass and vocal thing, which is pretty weird. And also, um, no one wants to listen to bass and vocals for like three hours. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't think. I don't want to listen to bass and vocals for three hours. And I was the bass player. So I played guitar in that. Um, and then I played piano in that as well. And so I started developing my abilities as a guitar player in public because I have spent my whole life around people that were really good at playing guitar. So I'm very aware of how bad I am at it. <laughs> Every man I've dated is a guitar player. Every My dad's a guitar player. <laughs> so you know what the bar is. Oh, I like love playing with great guitar players. So yeah, I know what the bar is. And so anyways, I did this, I said yes to doing this thing that I sucked at and was scary at and doing it in a platform where people could see me doing that. And I practiced doing that for a, for a bunch of years. Hmm. And then I got this call because people had been seeing me play guitar. Yep. And I want to say that because I'd been doing it, um, that I said immediately yes to playing guitar for Jan Arden, but I absolutely did not because I was like, I don't know if I actually can. So I, they didn't ask for this, but I made an audition tape. <laughs> Because I was going to have to play insensitive, like everyone's beloved Jan Arden song, by myself with Jan, acoustically, with no one else there. And, and then there was a fiddle player, and we were going to be singing, and it's just three of us. It was a huge ask. And I didn't want to, like, oversell any of my abilities, because who knows what I'm going to be capable of doing in front of 10,000 people. Like there was a lot of self-doubt going on? I think I was being realistic. Yeah, okay. I was just absolutely being realistic. Because you knew what the level was going to be, and you're like, Can I was. I, get there? I knew what the ask was, and yep. I knew what my ability was, and so um, I put together a little audition tape and sent it in. I, I played what I was what I was thinking I was going to play. They also didn't send me anything like, I, and I wasn't even going to have a rehearsal with Jan Arden. Like it was wild. And um, but when I and then you know they hired me for the gig. Didn't have a rehearsal with Jan. Met Jan on stage. Found out she'd come to one of my Jocelyn and Lisa shows, which was very cool. Awesome. She's amazing. And uh, we just, I played for her. We figured it out. And then we did the show. And I look back and I was like, what am I even doing? First of all, I'm playing music with Jan Arden. Mm -hmm. I'm playing a song that is like legendary for people. And people are having major experiences listening to Insensitive. I also grew up loving this song. I'm of the era where this is like a major, major hit. And I'm playing guitar, finger picking this thing. This is, I could have never thought of this in a million years. This is not happening for me. This is not a dream I have that I've worked toward. But what I did was say yes a million times along the way yeah. to things that felt comfortable and to things that felt uncomfortable. And then it just led me to being able to do things I couldn't have dreamed of. It's, um, 
It's so abstract. <laughs> this, like it's just, yeah. but it's right though. It's just there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, we're living life. We're just like trying to f- make the most out of every, not make the most. We're living life and we're just trying to figure it out as we go. Yeah. That's all we're doing every single moment of the day because who knows what tomorrow's going to bring. It could be amazing. It could be the worst. Mm-hmm. We don't know, right? Yeah. So. so what is it? Not over, not over analyzing it? Is it just like trusting your intuition that you're making the right decision, that you want to try these things? Like you did everything that led you to this moment that actually made a lot of sense. But along the way, like, what was it? Was it gut? Was it? Mm. I'm, I'm like, I'm fascinated by this just because it's, there's no blueprint for this. And there's no like, there really is no why explanation to actually figure this out. Yeah. But you're right though. It's like, you know, we're all just moving in a direction and you make good decisions and bad decisions. And yeah, it's, 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 um, I've spent so much time trying to figure this out for myself over a lot of years. Like when I was younger, like mm-hmm. being a creative person just didn't fit anywhere. And you're like trying to figure and just doing things and doing things. But now in my forties, I'm like, Oh, <laughs> this all makes sense. <laughs> and, I, and I'm always, yeah, it's very, uh, that's why I'm, I just don't know why that happens that way. I got to be honest. I don't have an answer for you. Mm-hmm. I think we're all different too. So I can't give a, a blanket yeah. statement for anybody. Yeah. And quite frankly, I'm full of doubts about my career all the time. It's so funny because literally someone two days ago at a gig was talking to me and she's much younger than me and much earlier and on in her career. And she's just curious about, you know, if, if I, you know, she's talking to me about her doubts and I was like, oh yeah, literally just last night was like, what am I even doing with my life? Like, can I even play music? I don't know. It's ludicrous. My theory on doubts though, is that you've given, you've given this thought before. Yeah. Oh, cause I'm doubting all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and so is everyone else. That's the kicker. I mean, we can't be confident and assured all the time. Yep. We're a million different kinds of things, but, um, My theory about doubting ourselves, myself at least, is that um, I am taking on things that stretch me, that push me out of my comfort zone. And the more that I continue to do that, the more that I'm going to be filled with doubts about what my ability are until I actually do something. And with every new experience I have, I'm able to invest in my confidence in myself. But it's never ending as far as like having to invest in that confidence because I have chosen a life and I've chosen to be the kind of person that says yes to scary things. Not 100% of the time though, because nobody wants to live in a life where you're being stretched all the time. Mm-hmm. I've created a world where there's a balance of stuff I feel comfortable, I feel confident, and I feel like I can do this. And then also a world where I'm taking on things that make me feel nervous mm-hmm. and um, are stretch. Yep. Is that a conscious decision? Or have you just like seen your, seen your, seen a pattern that you kind of understand how you operate now you can now it makes more sense um i have made a conscious choice about that mm. before i could see the pattern how do you what got you thinking along those lines to think like that to understand that you need these like two these two movements to make it work properly oh okay so here's what's so cool about living <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, one is that I've or at a very early age I discovered that I love balance. I crave balance, I create balance. Like if I if I'm in a room with a bunch of extroverts, I am absolutely content to just chill out and listen to a million stories. If I'm in a room with a bunch of people that are really quiet, I am fantastic at sharing stories, about asking people questions, about creating that kind of energy. Mm-hmm. I seek that out no matter what I'm doing. And um And so I've created kind of a life like that, you know, like as a music therapist, there's just like one aspect of me, certain kind of aspect of me that gets fulfilled. And then as a musician, whole other kind of thing. I get to run through both of those worlds. Um, Really early on, I started to see that um, we need kind of, I'm getting sidetracked. I'm just going to share this thought. It might not be fully on topic. Trust me. My brain just has gone there. (laughs) That's the best part. Yeah, this is where the good stuff comes from. It's connected to balance. Also, what's so funny is during your Russell interview, he's like, he's like balance is the devil, which I laughed at so hard. I know. Like the, the, the conversation around balance is very, Mm -hmm. very interesting. And he, and his, his explanation like really stuck with me 
because when you're chasing something at that level, like, well, you got to do it better than everybody else. So where's the balance in that? Absolutely. And it's so funny because I, um, I heard him talking about that. It's also the exact opposite way I feel about life and the exact opposite thing I tell that tell people. Crazy. Um, but I gleaned from that. Mm-hmm. And he's so right. Like, you can learn from the way everybody experiences life. And Russell, he is, he excels at what he does because he focuses at it. His mm-hmm. level um, and musicianship is beyond what I can comprehend. But I chose to focus on a couple of other things. And so the way that I wander the planet is different than the way that he wanders the planet. The way that I connect with music and with people, um, there's lots of similarities between us, but also it's different, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I chose balance because it makes me happy. And I have wondered, I've wondered this about my professional career a lot. So I still wonder about it all the time. Like had I just chosen to focus on music, Mm -hmm. where could I be? what could I have done with what was given to me if I had just been a bass guitarist, if I had just done music? And conversely, same with music therapy, like what kinds of conferences could I be speaking at? What kind of like amazing research, what kind of cutting edge stuff could I be doing mm-hmm. if I'd focused at being a music therapist? And I am constantly feeling the pull in either direction. And the fact that I'm not able to do all the things that I want to do in either area. Mm-hmm. and and I'm not able to like live up to all the possible potential I have in either area. I'm feeling that. I can recognize that. I can see that people can see that in me. Mm. Um, you know, I think when people sometimes, and for a really long time when I was young, people would like stare at me and be like, why aren't you a superstar playing with Prince? All the time. That was the number one thing people said to me. And I was like, first of all, do you even know what that requires? <laughs> You know, when I look at myself in the context of like my music therapist colleagues and the work that we're doing and the exciting stuff that's happening and when I go to conferences and I'm like, man, like if I really focus, like what kind of incredible damage could I do in that mm-hmm. field? Mm-hmm. And I've really just come to see that I think the way that I showed up in this world was like, I don't need to be radically exceptional at anything the thing that makes me happy is like being able to do a couple of different things and feeling that space in the world, yep. you know? And so that's why, like, it's not like my personality changes. It's that I require like these double versions of myself. And I noticed that even I did this personality test <laughs> and, <laughs> Which one? Uh, oh my gosh, I don't even know. Cause it was so obscure and you can How figure long ago it out. This? this is like, I don't know, maybe six years ago. Okay. Okay. So like, it wasn't the blue, red, no, 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 I don't know. They, it, it, you ended up being a bird at the end. I was in this like professional workshop. Okay. So it was so great because I had never been exposed to it and was totally obscure. So you couldn't even tailor your answers to anything. You had to like actually be 100% honest. Because, you know, we're all trying to figure out what the schematic system is for this personality test. Um, but one of the reveals was that I am 50% extroverted and 50% introverted. Now, I have like known conceptually this idea about myself. Like I feel like we're all just re-understanding things we already know about ourselves. Like it's a new epiphany about something we already know, right? Yep. And so there was something about that actual percentage that changed me, that just illuminated life for me in a whole other kind of way. And I've been actually a- been able to like change the way I wander, change my emotions, change how I'm reacting to what's going on based on knowing this. So I've been using it very intentionally. Um, Well, I've been using it sort of like unintentionally before this part with how I like kind of be like in places and how I am on tour. But um, I've been using it like really, really intentionally. So when I start to feel really down, I was going, right when I did this personality test and I figured this out, I realized, I was going through like a really nice time in my life where I was not experiencing tons of sad shit. So there wasn't a lot of trauma going on. There was no like major dramas. Mm -hmm. There was not like grief happening. Like I just was like in a nice place. And yet I was still so sad. I would just go through these major sad waves and I'm like trying to like examine what's going on inside of me because there's nothing external that's causing these things, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to figure out the reason and blah, blah, blah. And like, I started to realize that, oh my God, I've just spent way too much time alone not talking to anybody. And I'm just sad because I need to go out into the world and steal people's energy. 
and like be some vibrant version of myself. And then I start to notice when I start to feel like a bit cranky or grumpy or sad again, I'm like, how much time have I been like mm. super social? How much gigging have I been doing? How much like hanging out with people and talking to strangers have I been doing? Like I need to go be completely alone in my room and not talk to anybody for two days. Mm. And then I'm back. And so this has been a wonderfully cool discovery for me because um, I have to seek out that kind of balance in yeah. my world and I'm able to just like figure it out and not have to like examine my whole life all the time. <laughs> Which is, um, it's, uh, it's gotta keep you calm to understand that, like to understand the, the high low, like you could probably, like you said, do some reflection, self reflection, figure it out quick and then there's a solution. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, quite frankly, I've just been doing this my whole life. It's mm. like with each year that we live, we just rediscover the same thing about ourselves yeah. in a in a next level kind of way. Yeah, and we're able to like walk it out even more intentionally than perhaps or consciously, I guess is a better word. What's interesting is back to Russell. The dude obviously blew me away too. And, <laughs> but he said, you know, the imposter syndrome. You know, twenties and thirties. You know, a lot of a lot of things, and then the, in your forties, things just click. And this could be part of it too, like understanding these things at a, di at a different level, like just more experiences to back it all up. Absolutely, more experiences, just more failures, mm. more successes, more mm -hmm. understanding of what that both means. Yep. And more time to just like see who you are in a variety of situations and circumstances. Yep. Yeah. Uh, this has been, a <laughs> the, you're so thoughtful. It's just, it's wild. This has been a really cool one. Awesome. Okay, I'm glad. Sorry, how long did we talk for? Was well, it really long? We're, this the, we're at a, we're an hour and seven minutes. Okay. But I started a few minutes a few minutes early, so we're like an hour and five. Okay, sweet. It's been super cool, and I think um, thanks for going along with me when I was like poking you with those uh, the musician questions because I think there's people listening that want to know how people like you get to where you are and what makes you tick. So I agree. It was cool. I you know what? I wish I had like I had an actual better answer for that but, but like i just feel like all if i can't say if i don't i don't have something i can say with conviction like yep. i don't really need to answer it i could have made up like 15 yeah. things but i just have anything in the moment i agree yeah um i end the show with one question okay when i say calgary where's your head go home growth opportunity mm. it's cut and dry hey <laughs> which is good i can expound do you want me to expound what? expand no yeah like give her Okay, so when the I... The way you think, I'm like, yes, go. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I think of Calgary, the first thing I think of is home because this has been my home. Um, born here, like been a part of investing into what Calgary is and what it can be. People have asked me all the time why I didn't move away to a center that has a lot more music and a lot more opportunities. And one of the reasons is, is because I feel like I'm an inside out kind of person. And if everybody that is artistic leaves the city to go somewhere else. What's gonna happen to the place that you're in? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to invest in here. Um, do you want me to keep going the other two? Yes, okay. you, you got, we got, I got lots of space <laughs> on these <laughs> cards. You, you keep going. Um, so when I said growth, I think, I, I love our city. We take a lot of slack and we get a lot of hits from other places, but I think that Calgary is full of growth and it's growing and I've seen a lot of changes and shifts happening in the artistic community as far as like diversity grow, uh, goes. I think people come here because there is growth and it takes me to opportunity as well because Calgary is a city of opportunities. and. I sometimes tell young people and like one of the things that was really beneficial for me as a young musician was that I got paid. Like not every city that you go in can you get paid to play music. Oftentimes you have to pay to play music. And in Calgary that was like at the at the early stages of my career that really reinforced things. Um, it was that I would do a job and then I would get financially compensated for the job. And that was offered here mm. which is really special. And so people come here for opportunity and there are lots of opportunities here. Awesome. I'm glad you decided to expand on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for taking the time. Mm. It's been super cool to hear your story. Yeah. Oh man. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It's been um, it's been really fun. And 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 talking to musicians is always fascinating. Like it's just the creativity and how you and what makes you tick is always really cool to hear. <sighs> Well, it's so fun because like you know about the world a little bit, so you're asking like very like pointed questions. Mm -hmm. um, 
And now it's so funny as I'm gonna like wander away and be thinking about like, I don't know how I got to be where I am right now. Mm -hmm. Which is, yeah. And you know what, like I keep getting hit up by a lot of, of young people um, just to ask, like just to get together yep. for coffee and stuff. And, and how do you how do you handle that? Oh, I love it. Yeah. I'll just try it. Uh, the thing is though, sometimes I'm like, I'm bad at making it happen or yep. stuff goes on, but it's been great because um, people will persist. And so we've been going, we, I go for coffee with just like random people or go for a, a beer with um, new young people. And, and I just love caring where they're at in their lives and what's happening and how they're feeling about it all. And I think to, there's a lot of conceptions about what it is and what it requires and takes to be a musician. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of those things I didn't really do. So like, I am not super great at practicing. Like I don't love just shedding like my instrument at home and sit there for like a billion hours. Like I'm just not that player, mm -hmm. but I feel guilty about it all of the time that I'm not that person. But the more that you live life, the less you're just, you just want to feel less guilty. So I've just come to accept that that's not Until how I do things. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to like offer a little bit of like freedom, mm -hmm. I think to some young people about like who they have to be to yep. be able to be a really good musician. Yep. You know, like I'm practicing at home. I still have to do a job. But it's just like I always compared myself to like these electric guitar lead players who can like practice at home for like eight hours. Mm -hmm. And they're amazing. It really mm -hmm. shows. Yep. Um, but they just had to be comfortable with doing that stuff alone. And I just in many ways wasn't. And, and even just like, you know, like to be a professional musician, can you do other jobs? And I'm like, well, if some of the other stuff that you do, absolutely is going to serve you as a musician because you learn a ton of skills doing anything if you desire to do that you learn people skills maybe you learn computer skills you know like mm -hmm. i worked in an investment banking firm in mezzanine financing for a couple of years helped me put my put me through university but i learned all about excel spreadsheets like yep. knew more, learned more about them and did all this like admin stuff and yep. did all these things that helped me design cd covers and yep. make t-shirts and mm -hmm. make posters yep. you know what i mean like there's no like one direct path that anybody takes. And I think as long as we're willing to like learn and be challenged and say yes and do weird stuff and also say no to things that don't feel great, there's yeah. all of that. Yeah. So I've been enjoying talking to like young people. Also cause like it's fun to be around people that are like not jaded by life yet. Mm -hmm. I feel like everyone mm -hmm. in their like thirties in the arts community get like a bit like yeah. grouchy. Yeah, they've been chasing something for a while and they can't see the where it's going. Yeah, and then it's like, <clears throat> I, I've got to make decisions about this before yep. I hit 40, yep. you know? And so everyone's just tired and jaded and grumpy and like the music business is taking its toll. And so um, that's the reality of like that time period that you just got to walk out for yep. a lot of people. But I'm like, oh, it's just so great to be around youth because they're just like, wondering like the world is open and mm -hmm. full of opportunities yep. and they just have so many anxieties because mm. you should and then they also are so naive because also you wouldn't do anything unless you were naive about it yeah like you wouldn't take any risk so sorry interesting though, i'm right? like in a chatty space now <clears throat> but, because <laughs> but, it's, it, but it's it's um it's interesting that it's like it's becoming a bit of a mentor and mm. for, for whatever reason mm -hmm people look at you as either being receptive to the idea of talking to them or mm -hmm. they see you playing at a high level and they're like, oh, I wonder if I get access to this person. If you start saying yes, they'd be like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think too, also though, my colleagues have like mentioned me to other people yeah, cool. too and then point me in that direction. Awesome. Oh, actually though, I do have a really good theory. Can I tell it to you? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what's funny is I had wanted to share it earlier. I had I, it was like there, but then I moved on to something else. But that's probably my fuck up. Perfectly. No, no, um, it was one hundred percent self directed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it actually does have to do with mentorship. So I think there's this sentiment that um, is going around that's been around for a long time, where it's like um, you never want to be the smartest person in the room, which sounds like a really incredible idea but I feel like um, everybody needs both we need to sometimes be the most inexperienced um, the most like like the person lacking skill the the dumbest person in the room so that we can learn and glean and like just grow and then we also need to be top dog sometimes so that we have confidence we need to be the best player in the room we need to be the person with the most experience so that we can 
be a leader and we can direct others and we can exercise an area of confidence because if we're constantly the underdog, you never feel comfortable about anything that you do. And so I learned that really early on in my music career because I was playing with all of these like grown men with loads of experience. I can't even believe they let me come on stage with them. And I just learned a ton of things from them. But while I was doing that, I was also simultaneously the music director of this youth band. And I wasn't the oldest person in the band, but I definitely had the most musical experience. And um, I, I had ideas and was able to like be a leader. And so I go into this space where I'm not top dog, but like I'm experienced and I'm exercising leadership. So mm -hmm. I got to be both of those things at the same time, which developed and grew different areas of me. And so when it comes to mentorship, like we got to make space to be amongst people and grow people along, grow people up alongside of us. We never always want to be in a situation where everyone's brilliant all of the time, mm -hmm. because what's happening to the young people, what's happening to the people that, um, need a leg up or just need to be uh, be able to experience what it's like to be around people experience because yeah. like honestly i'm still the underdog in situations i get into all the time which is exciting it's so great mm -hmm. you know all the time and i'm sometimes still like I i'm really experienced and great at what i do and the most experienced person or the oldest person in the room you know yeah so i think we need both of those things and it's really important for us to have them both of, of course it is because balance, I was balance, just, balance, yeah, balance. I was just going to say balance. <laughs> like, you just like, ding, put a bow on everything. <laughs> we can do like a side-by-side -side clips of like super incredible Russell Broom like talking about how balance <laughs> is like the devil. And I'm like, balance, I live for it, mediocre. I'm, <laughs> I'm doing it for sure. <laughs> So funny. Also, because I did a really weird dance. Yeah, totally. What is this dance? You're getting it. <laughs> uh, that's perfect. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. That was uh, super enjoyable, and I appreciate your time. Oh man, thanks for having me. This was also very comfortable and easy to do. You create like a really nice space. To awesome. Be in. I appreciate it. Thank you.